this lesson, I'm going to teach the basic right hand technique that is the foundation for claw hammer banjo playing. This is a great lesson for someone that's never played the banjo and is ready to get going, or is an experienced banjo player and wants to improve their accuracy and speed. Let's talk about how you're holding your banjo. I like to keep my banjo neck right about here. Not too low, not too high, just right. If from where you're sitting, you think about your banjo pot as a face of a clock, and the banjo neck is the needle, you'd have 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock. I keep my banjo neck between 9 and 10, so right about here. The angle of your banjo neck is going to affect how you play your banjo. With my banjo neck right about here, I have a very straight, relaxed wrist. If my banjo neck was down here, I would have to change my wrist angle and the way my hand attacks the string. And this has tension. I don't want this tension in my playing. If my banjo was way up here, again, I'd have this angle that's unnatural. So I like to keep my banjo neck just so. You can keep your banjo between two legs, maybe on one knee, or on a strap secured. Let's talk about your basic right hand technique. Let's start off by relaxing your hand and getting it in a neutral position that's tension free. To me, claw hammer is all about being tension free and relaxed. So when your hand is neutral and in a relaxed position, where is it at? For me, it's not this straight as a board hand because look, you see all this tension in my hand. It's not a fist. You can see the tension in my hand again. When it's neutral in a relaxed state, it makes a claw. And this is the shape I'm looking for for claw hammer, is this neutral position where I'm relaxed. And it's a claw shape, hence the word claw hammer, which is the style we're learning. Something to remember is that this is my relaxed neutral position for my right hand. Everyone's a little different. So your hand might be a little straighter or it might be a little more curved in when it's in its neutral resting position. Now, the goal is to get you playing in your neutral resting position. If you have to modify it a little bit down the road, that's okay, don't worry. Now that your right hand is in a relaxed, neutral claw shape, it's time to make some noise. I want you to take either your index or your middle finger and put the back of your nail on top of the first string. I want you to put your thumb on top of the fifth string. This is your resting home position. Now that you're in home position, I want you to think of your right hand as knocking on the door. The movement's going to come from your wrist. I want you to go up and then back down, landing on that first string and thumb landing on the fifth string. And you're going to roll through that first string, making some noise. So we're going to do it again. I'm not going to play my fifth string. I'm just going to let it land there. Now I want you to remember that my finger and my thumb work as a unit. They go up together and they go down together, landing at exactly the same time, and everything is coming from this wrist motion. So I go up, I go down, and I land on that first string and roll through. And the space from my finger and thumb is widening just a hair when I roll through. I'm hitting the first string with the very middle of my fingernail. When I go up to hit the first string, I let the weight of my hand carry through the first string. I'm not pushing through the first string, I'm letting the weight of my hand do all of the work because my right hand is relaxed. Notice I'm not flailing out my fingers, I'm keeping my hand in a claw shape, working as a unit. My finger and my thumb are going to land on the fifth string and the first string at exactly the same time. I can let my thumb dig into that fifth string even though I'm not playing it. It can help to bounce your hand back up. All of the movement is coming from my wrist. It's not coming from my forearm. Not to say I don't move my forearm. I just think of it more as a uh, shock absorber. Since you're hitting your first string with the back of your finger, you're going to want to grow out your nail so that you have a hard surface to help wring out the banjo. Now if you don't want to grow out your nails, there are other options. You could take a banjo pick and put it on backwards from how the three finger players put it on. So you have this surface barely sticking out to hit the string with. 
Or you could go to a nail salon and have fake nails. Or uh, some people buy on those stick-on nails. I make a fake nail out of a ping pong ball. And I like it because I can just take it off. If you're having trouble keeping this claw shape, here's a trick. You can take an old credit card and put it between your fingers and the palm of your hand. And it'll help keep this claw shape. You can't move your hand in and you also can't loosen your hand or the credit card will fall out. So look here. Cards in. There you go. Let's work on hitting your second string. Take the back of your fingernail and put it on top of the second string and thumb on top of the fifth string. Your hand's going to go up like it's knocking on a door and go back down rolling through that second string while thumb lands on the fifth string silently. Here's a tip for all the banjo players who are trying to improve their right hand accuracy. When I hit the second string, my finger rolls through and then is physically stopped by the first string. This has really helped me stay spatially aware of all of my strings. You can apply this to the third string. You'd be hitting the third string, rolling through, and being stopped by the second string. Same with the fourth. Be stopped by the third. If you're new to the banjo, don't worry about it. Just hit the string and see where it goes. Let's work on hitting your third string. Take the back of your finger and put it on top of the third string and thumb on top of the fifth string. Your hand's going to go up like it's knocking on the door and you're going to hit the third string on your downstroke. It's going to roll through while the thumb lands on the fifth string silently. Notice when I'm rolling through that third string, it rolls through and it's stopped by the second string. Let's work on hitting your fourth string. Your fourth string is probably the hardest string to hit because the spacing between your finger and your thumb is so small. So start off by putting the back of your nail on top of the fourth string and thumb on top of the fifth string. You go up with your hand like you're knocking on a door and then your hand's going to roll through that fourth string, stopping on the third string, and the thumb is going to land silently on the fifth at exactly the same time. You may be asking yourself, why is my thumb landing on the fifth string even if I'm not playing the fifth string? Well, the reason why is it helps you stay spatially aware of where everything is at and connected to your banjo. What you're trying to do is learn the space between your finger and your thumb. So your first string and your thumb has this much space. The distance between your fourth string and your thumb is small, it's about this much. So you've learned the space between your thumb and your finger so I can pinpoint where everything's at. Second, fourth, first. If my thumb wasn't landing silently on my fifth string, helping me to stay connected and spatially aware to where all my strings are at at all times, my finger would be free floating and I wouldn't know where everything is at. And I'd be using my forearm where my forearm is connected to my banjo pot to try and guess where everything is at. And that's a lot of room for error, which is why I use my thumb to help pinpoint where everything is at at any point. Before you move on to the next step, it's time to practice. All I need you to be able to do before going on to the next step is hitting the first string. Then you're ready to move on. But if you want to keep practicing, move on to your second string. Or your third or your fourth. Or you can alternate. You could go one, two, three, four, three, two, one, and then repeat. Or you can make it harder. You could go first string and then third string. Or second string and then fourth string. You might consider practicing this exercise with the metronome. I'll hit the first string on the downbeat of the one, two, three, and four. 
So. Then I'll move on to the second string. I find it helps to subdivide the beat from quarter notes to eighth notes. One and two and three and four and. It helps you keep better time. One and two and three and four and. Let's move on from our single string pattern and add in the thumb. We'll call this pattern index thumb. Earlier we were practicing just hitting a single string. Maybe your first, second, third, or fourth, and our thumb was landing on the fifth string quietly. Well, it's time for that to change. We're gonna let the fifth string ring out. We're gonna start off by putting the back of our fingernail on top of the first string, and your thumb resting on top of the fifth string. This is your home position. Your hand's gonna go up like it's about to knock on a door, and then the way your hand's gonna go back down and your finger's going to roll through the first string, and your thumb will catch on the fifth string and then roll off. So you have this, first, five, first, five, first, five, first, five, first, five, first, five. When my thumb rolls off the fifth string, my thumb makes a little circle pattern. Kind of like this. I'm over exaggerating, but that's what it's doing. Some banjo players hit their fifth string, and when they roll through, they bend their thumb like this. My thumb stays straight and rigid and just rolls through. It's different for everyone. There's not a wrong or right answer. Half the banjo players I know bend their thumb and the other half don't. So whatever works for you. I want you to practice hitting your first and fifth string for a while. Once you have this down, you can move on to the second and fifth string. Or the third and fifth. Or the fourth and fifth. Then you can move on to alternating strings. So you go first fifth, second fifth, third fifth, fourth fifth, then back to third, second, and first. If you want to make it harder, play your first fifth, then third fifth. Then move on to your second fifth and fourth fifth. I find it's useful to practice this exercise with the metronome as well. Each beat is going to get two notes. So you have one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and and so on. As I said earlier, I find it's useful to subdivide the beats from quarter notes to eighth notes. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Now you're ready for the next right hand pattern. In the banjo world, this pattern is affectionately called the bum ditty. I'm not joking, it's called the bum ditty because of its cadence. Bum ditty bum ditty bum ditty. It's a combination of the two patterns you already know, the single string pattern and the index thumb pattern. Here it is. One and uh, two and uh, As I said earlier, the bum ditty is a combination of the two patterns you already know. The single string pattern, 
where the thumb lands silently, and then the index thumb pattern where you hit the first string and then the thumb rolls off the fifth string. Each of these patterns will take up a full beat. So you'll have one and two and three and four and. Try and get the bum ditty ingrained in your head. The bum ditty bum ditty bum ditty bum ditty. You could also think of it as long, short, short, long, short, short, long, short, short because you have a long note and then the second note we subdivide. So long, short, short, long, short, short. Once you can do the bum ditty on one string, you can move on to your second string. Or your third. Or your fourth. If you're practicing with a metronome, this is what it'll look like. Single string, index, thumb. Single string, index, thumb. Bum, diddy, bum, diddy. So, one and two and three and four and, or one, two. ready for your brush stroke. Your brush stroke is when you hit your fourth, third, second, and first string all in one downward motion with the back of your fingernail. Notice that my thumb is going to catch on the fifth string silently. My thumb lands on that fifth string just as my finger hits the fourth string and brushes through. Also notice that this is not like knocking on a door. I'm actually going to engage my forearm and it's going to go side to side a bit. It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of knocking and moving your forearm. Once you have your brush stroke down, try engaging your fifth string and letting it ring. Now we're at the end of our lesson and we have one exercise left to go. We're going to take our bum ditty exercise and add in our brush thumb stroke. So we'll take our single string, index thumb, single string, index thumb, and we'll substitute the index thumb for a brush thumb stroke. So we'll have single string, brush thumb, single string, brush thumb, single string, brush thumb, or bum. So I want you to practice this on every string, starting with the first string. First string, strum top, first string, strum top, then second, and then third. Let's talk about the bum ditty pattern before we quit and hang everything up. This right hand exercise is the most important exercise for you to practice because it is the foundation of claw hammer. Basically what's going on is you have melody, then rhythm, melody, strum, top, melody, strum, top. So we have melody in there and the rhythm. It serves two purposes. It's almost like you have a fiddler playing the melody and the guitar player playing the rhythm. You have melody, strum, top, or leave that strum and do the index thumb. Melody, rhythm, melody, rhythm. So if you think about this first note as being the melody and then having the rhythm afterwards, watch what you can do with just this one pattern over and over on your right hand. Same thing over. I'm just moving my 
left hand on to different notes. That's why it's so important that you get this right hand pattern down because you don't want to think about your right hand. You want to just know it cold. You want to be able to go bum, diddy without thinking about it. That way you can focus on your left hand, playing those notes and doing those hammer-ons and slides and making the melody note ring. I learned the banjo from my father. He has a very strict rule. You're not allowed to learn your first tune until you can play your bum diddy for one minute without messing up. Doesn't matter how slow or how fast, just one minute without messing up. Most tunes take about a minute to play, so his reasoning is if you can play the bum ditty one minute without messing up, you're ready and you can start focusing on the left hand and let the right hand just do its job. I practiced my bum ditty for about a month before I moved on to my first tune. Everyone learns at their own speed. Some people pick it up in a day, some people pick it up in a week, or even a month. It's okay. Go at your own speed. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and you come back for your first tune. Thanks.